very happy and pleased to welcome Graham Arman. Thank you. And I, can I suppose I could probably do this without a microphone in principle, but I think I probably need to do it because of the way it's being taped for the website. Okay, so I'll speak into the microphone, and I hope that's not too artificial in such a small room. It's been a, a wonderful day, a fairly exhausting one, and for that reason, I'm going to target this for around 35 to 40 minutes to not make people fall asleep. It's 6.40. I'll keep an eye on the watch and adjust my pace depending on how things are going. Also, for me, it was uh, an exhilarating day and also an exhausting one. And I think the reason it was exhausting, as I was remarking to Teo during one of the breaks, is that when a field is new to you, as architecture is completely new to me, uh, you're unable to simplify information. I was having to process all of the information that came to me because I have no way of knowing which parts were important, which parts are not important, and so I'm struggling to process all of it simultaneously, and so I was falling behind some of these very rapid questions from the other jury members and needed some time to catch up with them. And I think that's actually relevant to tonight's lecture because in a way, philosophy, which sometimes gets defined as critical thinking or in other ways, I think is actually more importantly the art of simplifying. You're taking a very complicated world and breaking it down into four or five basic structures uh, in any philosophy and repeating those same structures over and over and over again, often through 15 or 20 different books. Or in Heidegger's case, up to 102 books are projected uh, which are all extremely simple uh, once you break them down, as I tried to show in the recent book that I just gave to Teo. And in fact, I'm going to do a little simplification tonight here, too. I'm going to simplify the whole of philosophy down to one problem, which is objects. And the process will also simplify the whole of the history of philosophy down to about 10 minutes on the history of objects. So I'm going to uh, practice what I preach with simplification. What is an object? Well, objects are quite out of fashion in philosophy these days, and I'm trying to do something to change that, including this week. Uh, and if any of you are free on Friday and want to go to the speculative realism panel at Goldsmiths, all you have to do is email Alberto Toscano, and Nina has his email address. I don't have it memorized. Uh, there should be some seats left. It will be a panel of four people, which we call speculative realism, because realism has been out of fashion in philosophy. Uh, what's been more in fashion in philosophy for the past several centuries is the idea that the human access to the objects constitutes the objects, or perhaps that there's nothing outside of the human access to begin with. Maybe I can lift this and I won't have to stoop. Um, and it's called speculative realism because realism is usually viewed as the, the stodgy philosophy of common sense. Uh, realism is what you use to smack down the philosophers who are getting too imaginative and going too far, whereas the panel on Friday will be for people without much common sense at all. Uh, realists with no common sense, with a lot of imagination. Okay, but that's for Friday. As for tonight, uh, what, what defines an object? There are several things that define an object, and it's gone under many different names in the history of philosophy. One thing, of course, is an object has to be a unit. It has to be one thing, and this is why Leibniz called them monads, from the Greek word for one thing. Objects should be something independent of their qualities, so that the qualities can change over time, and they remain the same object in some way. Some philosophers have denied that such a thing is possible. And the fact that whenever the qualities of a thing change, it's automatically a new thing. I oppose this theory. And finally, it should be independent of its relations. You should be able to shift it around between different relations at different times. It should be able to have different relations to other different objects simultaneously while still remaining the same thing. And again, there are philosophers who think this is impossible. I'm simply not one of them. I defend the integrity, the autonomy of objects from all qualities, all relations, uh, and all possible uses that can be made of them. So the quick whirlwind tour of the history of philosophy here, and Nina's probably given you quite a bit of this during a, a whole term already. In a way, philosophy was born as a theory of substance, though it didn't carry that term, because if you look at the first philosophers, the pre-Socratics in ancient Greece, what they are trying to give us is what is the one thing that explains all the rest? What is the one thing from which the others are derived? And in the case of Thales, usually called the first philosopher, you have water as the first principle of everything. And you have alternative theories. You have Anaximenes saying everything is air, so that this podium is simply very highly compressed air, iron even more compressed. And then take air and make it less dense, and you have fire, so it goes up. In the case of Empedocles, you have the classical four Greek elements, which I believe he was the first to assemble in a system, air, earth, fire, and water. None of them reducible to the others, but simply interacting uh, by means of love and hate, he said. Uh, so you have the four elements mixed by two principles, love and hate. Democritus, of course, uh, said it was atoms, which means the uncuttable things in Greek. And so there you've got different theories which put a different material at the basis of the, of the cosmos. 
There's another set of theories among the pre-Socratics, though, centering around what's called the aperon, uh, the boundless or the limitless, sometimes translated maybe incorrectly as the infinite, uh, simply that you have an indeterminate universe and that the individual parts of it are somehow derivative of that. Either they're illusory or they were created through a certain process off of that massive hole that we began with. And uh, Anaximander was the first theorist of this, and he said that opposites are a kind of injustice, and that opposites will destroy each other over time, and at some point, perhaps millions of years in the future, everything will have destroyed everything else, and we'll end up with the Aperon again, which obviously had some influence on Marx and on some other theories. Then you have Anaxagoras with a very similar name, who said there was an Aperon, which thanks to an all-powerful mind began rotating very quickly in a circle, so fast that it began to break into pieces. So all of us are pieces of this mighty Aperon that used to exist, and since we all came from the same hole, we all have pieces of each other in us. So there are pieces, in, in, in my body there are pieces of trees, dogs, rivers, and there are simply more pieces of me so that they dominate me, and this is why I look like this rather than one of those other things. Uh, you've got Parmenides for whom the very apparent existence of individual things is an illusion of the senses to begin with, and being simply is and non-being is not. What's really underneath it all is being. And then you've got Pythagoras, who is sort of on both sides of the fence, because on the one hand, he thinks numbers are the substance of everything. And on the other hand, he also thinks we started with an aperon, which inhaled voids. It, there was a vacuum outside the aperon, it inhaled, and this created bubbles that broke it into pieces and, and created individual things. I'm gonna speed up a little here on the historical parts. Uh, uh, then, of course, you have Plato, for whom the substance is generally considered to be the perfect forms, uh, qualities that, uh, recur in various specific objects, green or strong, I suppose, are recurring in, in many specific objects, but those specific objects are somehow less real than the recurrent perfect forms. And then Aristotle, uh, who in some ways is the reverse, for whom the individual objects are primary. And so uh, whiteness is not primary, it's always existing in the case of specific white things. The concept of white is simply something our mind abstracts from the many particular objects. And then I'll, I'll run really quickly through the next thousand years because then you had philosophy dominated by monotheism. And so the substance then is generally taken to be either God or in some cases the soul. And so far of all the names I've listed, other than Aristotle, uh, something fairly bad has been said about substance in my opinion, which is that it's eternal. It cannot be destroyed. Uh, Aristotle is, I think, the one of these names so far. This is you can actually destroy a substance. You can, you can kill a horse and burn the body. Or, do something like this that actually destroy a substance. And so it's not eternal. Though Aristotle did believe it was natural. That uh, things that exist by nature, such as trees, flowers, animals, are real substances, and things such as machines are not, which I think is also a bad idea. But that persisted uh, up into the 1600s, and even now, perhaps. Okay, I'm gonna skip uh, most of the rest of the historical remarks I made, except to say that Leibniz was perhaps the last great substance philosopher in the West, 1646 to 1716. Leibniz's theory of monads, we have a stranger version of Aristotle's theory of substances, so that everything that is real is a substance, it's called a monad. You can think of it as a soul, and into this soul are projected all of the things that will ever happen to the monads. And all, and throughout the, at, the, at the time of creation, all monads were created, and everything that will ever happen to them is also created. And so Leibniz has a real problem trying to find any freedom uh, in this system. Every, action, every smallest action of Julius Caesar and of all of us is programmed into our monads, not just from the time of birth, but from the time of the creation of the universe. And uh, again, a problem here that I find is that Leibniz only allows certain things to be substances, namely the things that exist by nature. He would not allow the architectural association to be a substance. He would call it an aggregate. It's made of many parts. The substances would be the people and perhaps the natural materials of which the building is built. Everything else is a mere aggregate or a chain uh, of things. And he gives examples of these false substances such as a pair of diamonds glued together, a circle of men holding hands, the Dutch East India Company. These are things that might seem to have some physical integrity in themselves, but it doesn't matter because they're not by nature. Okay, so I'll skip the other philosophers of that period except to say that objects have been extremely out of fashion since the time of Kant. Uh, for the reason that Kant, who calls his philosophy a Copernican revolution, tries to turn philosophy on its head and say that philosophy is no longer about the things, it's about our access to the things. It's about the conditions of possible human perception uh, of the things. And you can't even say, according to Kant, that there is more than one thing in itself out there. 
we can't even say that it's multiple or one. Uh, it seems that there's something outside of our access to the world, because there can't be appearances without something that appears, yet we can't really say anything definite about it. Uh, and you certainly can't say anything about how one object interacts with another independently of any human consciousness of it, because you can't know that there are more than one thing uh, outside of our perception of the world. So there are a couple of kinds of philosophy we can talk about now that dominate, and you can simply say idealism is the opposite to, uh, of realism. Idealism being the belief that there is nothing real outside of our access to it. This will be the extreme form. Most philosophers do not adopt this extreme form because it seems so counterintuitive. You obviously have Berkeley in the 17th or 18th, early 18th century saying that everything is merely perceptions and God is correlating the perceptions among themselves to make them look like they're happening regularly. Uh, the really dominant form of hidden idealism that you get today is what the young French philosopher Mayasu calls correlationism. It's a term I think he just published last year for the first time. Correlationism is the philosophy that you can't have humans without the world or the world's without humans. The world without humans. The two of them are necessarily correlates. They have a rapport between one another and you cannot sensibly speak about either of them apart from one another according to this theory which Mayasu attacks and in my view rightly. We have to be able to talk about things outside of human perception, and I'll say why in a moment. Um, I think objects are coming back, and I'm going to give some reasons for that. And to re repeat uh, what I said about objects, they have to be unified things. They have to be deeper than their accidents, obviously, but I could have easily worn a different jacket than this from this today. I could have dyed my hair a different color. These, these are accidental things that don't really affect who I am. They have to be deeper than their qualities because the qualities of a thing can change over time. A person can become uh, religious from being non-religious or do any no number of other things to change even what seem like their most important qualities and it would still be s uh, meaningful to call them the same person. And I would say deeper than all relations. In an obvious sense, if I were to pace back and forth in front of the room, my, relation, my spatial relations to all of you would change. This would not affect who I am. If I discover that my two brothers are actually my stepbrothers and the secret has been hidden from me for years, I'm still the same person. My relation to them may change. It may affect my life in major ways, traumatic ways, but I am still the same person in some sense. Now, I, I realize that people are familiar with Bruno Latour here to some extent, and reading Latour was a real revelation for me. I came out of, out of Heidegger. I was a real Heideggerian back in the 90s. Late in the 90s, I accidentally this contradicts my own theory. It was by accident that I encountered Latour's books, and it did change me as a, as a person and a thinker. Now, what uh, Latour is not really a realist. Uh, he, I would call myself a realist. Latour really isn't, and I'll say why in a moment. But what's really important about Latour, first of all, he puts all objects on the same level. He does not draw a distinction between natural substances and artificial aggregates. The architectural association is an actor for Latour. It can do things that the individual people here cannot. It can retroactively affect all of your lives. It can act outside of these walls and accomplish certain things that all of you put together could never do as an institution. And that's something Latour is very good at identifying, that you have different levels of objects, actors he calls them. Objects is my term, substances is the ancient term. Uh, Latour's term, of course, is actors in uh, acting in networks, and a network can form a new object. In a sense, the architectural association is a network of many different actors, but you could, viewed from outside, it's a unified actor. Latour also gives resistance back to the things. Uh, Latour makes, uh, anytime I'm dealing with anything for Latour, whether it be a subway train or a library or a, a virus, uh, you can't just project what you want onto that thing. You have to negotiate with it. You have to, it takes work to learn its qualities. You have to do translation to try to translate what the thing is in a language that others will understand to influence them. And so the thing uh, has more power, more resistance in Latour than in virtually any other contemporary philosopher I can think of. And that, that to me was pretty evident in the first 20 pages or so that I read. And I, I since then went on to become quite a great fan. Um, there's a downside to Latour. There's a reason that I would not call myself a, a Latourian either, as, as inspired as I am by his books. And he knows this. I'm not talking behind his back. He's a friend, and I've, I've had this argument with him a number of times. Uh, one of the problems is that for Latour, who was very influenced by Whitehead, Whitehead would be his hero philosopher just as Heidegger is mine, uh, for the tour, a thing is its relations, essentially. Even though there's a sense in which a thing resists its interactions with other things and retains something more, it turns out not to be quite true. A thing for the tour, if you look closely, is its interactions with other things. If you try to say there's something outside of that, in a kind of vacuum outside of relations, Whitehead has this great term, vacuous actuality, which he means as an insult. If you try to talk about physical substance apart from its relations with other things, 
Uh, Whitehead calls it vacuous actuality. Uh, he means vacuous in the sense of superficial in an insulting term, uh, as an insulting term. Uh, Latour would seem to say the same, because for Latour, as a thing changes its relations across time, just as for Whitehead, it's really not the same thing anymore. You can refer to it, to me, as a trajectory across time. I closely resemble who I was before this long day uh, on the jury. I closely resemble who I was, but I'm not quite the same person anymore. Maybe I've gained something, maybe I've lost something, maybe a bit of both. I've been eroded and augmented. But uh, um, I'm not quite the same person for either Latour or Whitehead. You could, Whitehead would call it a society. Latour, at least in his early works, calls it a trajectory. And so there's something going across time of closely related actors that are not quite the same. And I object to this. I think it's arbitrary to say that each individual moment is somehow more real than the underlying thing. Just because we have immediate percept perceptual access to each of the moments, I don't see that the underlying thing is less real than each of the moments. Um, okay, another problem I see in Latour's work, and this is the problem that Manuel Delanda has, by the way. I, was, I, I did this lecture last Friday at Goldsmiths on Latour and Delanda, comparing and contrasting them, and I was, to prepare for this, I was emailing Delanda in January and February, and he's going to, uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying this if it's on, I don't want to steal his thunder if it's going on the web, but he's going to publish a criticism of Latour uh, in the next couple of years in, a, in another book he's doing. And his criticism is going to be that Latour isn't realist enough, that uh, uh, whenever Latour talks about the interaction of two different things, um, there has to be a human observer there to mediate them. It's by, it, I, Latour is much more than philosophy of science, but it's no accident that he's called a philosopher of science and not a philosopher of nature. Philosopher of science is the human access to nature. It's the human measurement and observation of nature that interests Latour. What's, what's in Whitehead that's missing in the tour is this whole cosmological dimension where you've got atoms interacting with quarks and things sailing through the galaxies. This doesn't really happen in the tour. He's talking about human situations. Even when they're inanimate situations, they're things like the Metro Tunnel in Paris or um, you know, turtles and snakes. It still has something to do with human observation of the turtles and snakes and the impact it has on, on our societies. So this would be uh, one of my... Actually, those are three of my criticisms of Latour. They're all coming out in a book that I'm almost done with on Latour called King of Networks. Um, it should be done in, once I'm done with my next round of travels. I don't know when it will be printed. Um, but to repeat, he does bring objects back into philosophy in a way that f few or no other contemporaries do, with the possible exception of Whitehead. And this is why Latour will always be one of my contemporary heroes. But I think there are resources in contemporary philosophy for an even stronger philosophy of objects in a very unlikely quarter, and that would be in the phenomenological movements, Husserl and Heidegger, who are generally not seen as great fans of objects. I would point to the tool analysis of Heidegger, a famous tool analysis in Being in Time, uh, 1927, though the analysis was, was uh, fully formulated in 1919, eight years earlier, in a, an unpublished work. Uh, being in Time is generally regarded, not by everyone, but by the majority, perhaps, as the greatest philosophical work of the 20th century, and I would defend that conception of it, evaluation of it. Uh, what we have in the tool analysis is Heidegger's realization that our primary access to things does not come from looking at them. It comes from uh, perhaps using them, relying on them, taking them for granted. So an example would be the floor in this room. You were not thinking about it, most likely, until I mentioned it unless there were vibrations from the underground or there was an earthquake or unless you had your shoes off and were somehow feeling the carpet uh, with, your, with your feet. Um, the air you're breathing was something you probably are not thinking about unless you're asthmatic, uh, there's a lot of pollution in the air. In Cairo we do think about the air a lot because it's very oppressive and hangs there and is very horribly polluted most of the time. Um, your bodily organs you generally do not think about unless they fail and so forth. And Heidegger's general theory is there's a constant reversal between hidden equipment and visible broken equipment that becomes present as what it is. Okay, this is a, this is a fine theory. I think it's most, one of the simplest and most inspired moments of 20th century philosophy. But there are some problems with it. Heidegger does not push it as far as he should. The problem with it is it too easily becomes a distinction between theory and practice. Right? There's this practice that's, uh, that's hidden, that's invisible from us, and then when we theorize about it, it becomes visible. That doesn't go far enough for a couple of reasons. One reason is that practice also does not exhaust the objects. Uh, your unconscious use of the floor was also not exhausting the total reality of the floor. There was more to the floor than your practice was utilizing because your practices can change and find new things to use in the objects. The objects are going to exceed not only your theory and your vision, but also your, your practical relationships with them. And the other problem that we don't find in Heidegger at all 
is the relation of things between each other when no humans are around. Does fire, when it burns cotton, completely exhaust the reality of the cotton? Of course not. We can think of the color, the scent, the softness of the cotton as things that are irrelevant to the, the fire when it burns them, perhaps. There are, other, there are probably infinite properties of the cotton that can never be exhausted, not only by my theory, not only by my practice, but also by the fire, certainly by insects that crawl throughout the cotton. No object will ever fully grasp another object. And I think this is why objects are going to come back in philosophy because this is the great unthought of contemporary philosophy, something that no one's really talked about. You have inanimate relations in Whitehead, you have them in Latour, but for both of them, the relations exhaust the thing. What we don't have in any contemporary philosophers are things, independent things that exist and hide from each other as well as from us. This is the thing we've never seen, uh, at least since ancient philosophy, if then. So I think objects are coming back in Heidegger, but they're also coming back in Husserl. Now, Husserl was Heidegger's teacher. He was the founder of phenomenology. And Husserl tried to save philosophy from the natural sciences, which were making too much progress, eating too much into philosophy's territory in the late 19th century. Philosophy was in danger of turning into experimental psychology. And Husserl's way of saving philosophy from this fate, of simply becoming a commentary on the sciences, was to, as he said, bracket all scientific theories. Ignore everything you think you know about sound. If you hear a door slam, simply describe very exactly what you're hearing. What are all the different layers and contours of that sound in your mind as you're hearing it? Forget the theory of sound waves. Forget the theory of how the nervous system works once the eardrum vibrates. Uh, focus only on a patient description of exactly what you are experiencing. Okay, now Heidegger, of course, attacked this because this all has to do, this reduces things to their visibility for us. Heidegger is saying there's this deeper layer that we never see. But even Husserl, already disc uh, discovers a new sense of object. This is what he calls the intentional object, which means even here in our perception, there are objects, there are things that we don't see, but which structure our perception. For example, this, uh, I don't know what to call it, a podium lectern. No one is seeing the entire object here at the moment, right? You'd have to circle it from all possible angles. You'd have to view it from beneath. You'd have to view it from the inside and see all the interior parts. This is impossible. Nonetheless, there's also a sense in which this object here is not hidden. It's there before us. We all see it. I don't just look at this and think that I'm seeing a brown surface with hollow space underneath. I, I look at this and think I'm seeing a solid object, even though I can't see all parts of it at once. So there is something in our perceptions that structures our perceptions, uh, breaks them up into units. Uh, and so this is a second kind of object. I would say that Heidegger rediscovers real objects, things that are outside of us and that act on each other independently of us, whereas Husserl discovers objects uh, within our perception, which are nonetheless deeper than what we think we see of the perception. And I think that explaining how these two kinds of objects interact is where philosophy is going to have to go, because they're both there. Uh, they both need to be fathomed, and yet they're two very different things. Why is this object a different thing from the real podium? Well, the simplest reason is because it might not really be here. This might be a hallucination. Uh, this thing that I think I see might not have any impact at all on other things in the world because it's not independent of my perception. And yet still there is a unified object here in my perception. This is the second kind of object, Husserl's kind of object. I would disagree with the theory of British empiricism that what we see here are simply colors and shapes and that I then unify them into a, an object. That's not what happens if you think about it. What really happens is we encounter unified objects first and then maybe we invent an, an empiricist theory of individual qualities that get bound into objects. Also, a point that Husserl makes, and which Merleau-Ponty makes even better later on in the 1940s and 50s, is that we don't ever really see qualities in isolation from the things. The, the black of her shirt and of this recorder are not really the same black, even if they were identical in terms of the wavelength of, of lights uh, that, were, that was involved in that case. Somehow the object to which the color is attached affects how the color is perceived. He says that you can speak of a kind of, the blackness of a pen is, a, is similar to the blackness of moral evil. There's a certain kind of emotional content when you're perceiving colors. And so you can't subtract all of those factors away from color and measure them purely in terms of wavelengths of light. So the, the, the theory that begins with qualities and then later binds them into objects is false. And I would agree with that. Okay, so that I would say would be, the, w should be, the main theme of, of philosophy, uh, the kind of philosophy that's dealing with, with uh, the basic ontological structure of the universe, because you have these objects which somehow emit qualities that we do perceive, and they somehow have to interact, and it has to be explained how they interact. And here's the real problem for Heidegger, I think. 
if objects are defined as what is deeper than all relations, how do things relate? How do, th any, how do any two things in the world relate at all? If you define a thing as deeper than any possible qualities on its surface, deeper than any possible thing I can do to it or anything I can touch in it, how do two things touch in the first place? And this takes us back to a kind of philosophy that was known as occasionalism, which actually began among the Muslims. It began in Iraq among a school called the Asherites, who were very orthodox theologians who believed that God uh, th created things are so weak that they can't do anything. Not only did God have to create the universe, God has to actually create each individual thing that happens in the universe, otherwise it's blasphemy, otherwise you're giving the power of creation to created things, which the Asherites would not accept. And they were very strict about this, and their notion is no two things ever do touch uh, in the world. They all have to be mediated through God. This, of course, was later picked up in Europe in the 17th century. I would argue that Descartes is already part of this. Some historians nitpick and say that he wasn't, and you have to start with Malebranche, his great disciple. But certainly in, in uh, European philosophy in the 17th century, you have the same problem of how, how can things interact directly. And the answer generally was that they can't, that they, uh, God is needed to mediate. And I would argue that the uh, philosophy of skepticism that you see in Hume and a few others is simply the upside down version of this. Because what do you get in Hume? You get the problem that, that we can't prove there are any causal relationships. We see one thing happen and then we see another thing happen. And then through the force of habit, I assume that every time I put my hand in the flame, my hand will be damaged. Really, it's the same problem. It's just that God is not what mediates the thing here. It's you. It's you and your habits that link two things that should be separate and you assume that they always go together, such as eating bread and, and being nourished, um, jumping out a window and falling. Uh, there's no reason for Hume why this has to happen. Even if it seems to happen all the millions of times we've seen it occur, it's you who are responsible for arbitrarily linking two things through the force of habits. So I think occasionalism has always been at the heart of, of Western and Islamic philosophy. And Islamic philosophy, remember, is really just a branch of Western philosophy. It's not other in the least. It's, it's Greek philosophy. It's monotheism drawing on the same prophets. And so it's, it's the forgotten branch of Western philosophy. But Islamic philosophy is part of it. And they actually were onto this problem before we were in, the, in Western civilization, as we call it. Um, so I, I don't think this is eccentric in any way to bring this back as a central problem of philosophy. How do two things interact? Now, I think both of those options are horrible, though. I think if you, s if you say either that God causes everything or that the human mind links everything through habits, there's a problem there, which is it takes the, the power away from individual objects. Everything is either done by God or it's been done by the mind. What about all of these entities around us, most of which are not gods or minds? Uh, what role is given to them in their relations with other things? And so I have coined the, a term that I call vicarious causation, which means that two things have to interact, but they somehow have to interact in some other medium since they can't touch directly. And the solution I came up with, which is not quite a solution yet because it's barely off the ground and I can't get into it too much today, is that the only possible place two objects can interact is on the interior of a third object. Why do I think this? Well, because Husserl also discovered that objects can contain other objects. For example, um, my perceptions are in a sense contained, uh, all the things I see in my perception are in a sense contained within my perception. My entire, my entire conscious experience right now is in a certain sense an object. Why? Because I can talk about it, I can reflect on it, and none of my talk or my reflections will totally exhaust what it is. It's something very real with lots of depths that no, no outside or inside analyst can ever totally fathom. And so in a way my experience at this moment is a kind of object, and yet it contains other objects. It contains all of you as intentional objects, not real ones. Right? It contains you as units that support certain qualities. Um, uh, but they are contained inside of my experience as a real object. And so as strange as that, as that solution might sound, I think there's no other option. What happens is somehow real objects, which are always hidden, become converted into intentional objects on the interior of a third one, and this is where they interact. Things have to be converted into surfaces in order to interact. Uh, sometimes you hear Deleuze read as saying that uh, the surface is sterile and the, the causality al always comes from the depths. I would flip that upside down and say causation always happens at the surface. The depths can never interact and that all relationships are superficial in a sense. Uh, things can only relate superficially, uh, which I think would be anathema to Latour and Whitehead, but I'm going to maintain that position. If objects are hidden from each other, how do they affect each other? Um, whether that is two objects interacting in our mind or two objects interacting in the world outside our mind. And I'm going to wind up here because it's about the amount of time that I said I would take. But I think the key is to, is to study the way in which an object splits from its qualities. Because an object does have certain qualities. If objects did not have qualities, they'd all be alike. 
Leibniz said this problem. All monads must have qualities or all monads will be alike, which they're not. Each of us is different. Each thing is different. So a thing has qualities. Uh, the the um, so, so I think the next step we would have to take is, t is to see how the thing splits from its qualities. And the term I give to that is allure. And I think that happens in two places. I think it happens uh, in aesthetics, in the realm of human perception. And I think it also happens in causation. But perhaps there's enough material already to talk about, and I'll, I'll leave it off there. If you want to uh, uh, see a little more of what I've done with this theory, you can look at the uh, issue two of collapse, which just came out uh, a month or so ago. And that essay is called On Vicarious Causation. So I will stop here, 35 minutes exactly, good. And I'll take your questions. Thank you. I've been wondering that all afternoon, trying to, to formulate that, and I was hoping you would help me with that, because uh, this is my first extended experience with architecture just in the last few hours. Yes, it is. But it's got to be more than the assembly, because you're assembling something, and uh, when you're building something, you're not just assembling, right? You're also trying to bring the parts to life and bring out their qualities. You're not just linking things. You're also linking things in such a way that it brings out and selects certain features of the, thing, of the parts you're linking. Uh, when you assemble a, a car, I suppose you're trying to uh, optimize certain properties of the rubber and the tires while downplaying ones that are inflammability or other things that are more dangerous to the operation of the car. And so you're not just randomly putting things together in assemblage, you're, you're choosing certain properties in the things. And uh, surely this is something you've all had to think about in much more concrete terms than I have uh, with, with various projects. But uh, uh, one of the reasons I really enjoyed the first project that we saw is that it allows you to modulate the surface properties of the things indefinitely, infinitely. And I think by doing that, you're subtracting from those and somehow getting at something that's deeper inside the object. And so I saw it less as a as an evil tool for management or, or uh, uh, regulators than I did as a way of getting at an object that's deeper than all the possible surface properties that you have of it. And uh, doesn't art do that? I mean, uh, you're probably a little familiar with some of Heidegger's work on the origin of the work of art and building dwelling thinking, which is often popular among architects. What does he say that the statue lets the stone, stone come forth as stone. So you're taking something that's not, the statue is supposed to be more than stone and you're letting the stone shine forth. Whereas Heidegger thinks a mason is merely using up the stone. He's not letting the stone shine forth as a material. So somehow you are um, elevating the status of the parts of the thing when you're making an assemblage. You're not just linking them. Um, or or diminish, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, you could be diminishing them. You could ruin them. And so what I, what I sometimes miss in Latour is, is any sense of the independence of the actors outside of those um, interactions. And you can see this concretely in some of his case studies. For example, he does his Pasteur book uh, is in many ways attacking the naive idea of a great genius who comes along with all, all this social noise and he just simply breaks through all the distortion and finds the truth. And Latour tries to show all the, a the actors that, Latour, uh, that Pasteur must mobilize in order to get the vaccine. Uh, this is obviously true, and it's very uh, illuminating, yet at the same time, uh, and I think this is a criticism Delanda will make and some other realists have made of Latour, there is a sense, it's not nonsense to say that Pasteur was right and nobody recognized it. Let's say he had failed. You could still say, you could still make the statement, it would not be nonsense. We make these kinds of statements all the time. I'm the only one who realizes that such and such is the most important philosopher of the 1920s and other people don't recognize it. It's not a nonsensical statement. If the actors fail to mobilize around this figure, you can say that there's some greatness in something or some, some unlocked potential that, that no one has, has discovered yet. Um, concretely, in terms of today's projects, I was hoping you'd help me, or if other people, actually the people who did the projects uh, have any thoughts about that. Yes, yes uh-huh.
-hmm. Yes, I think he's wrong. He said, the w mm. no, okay. He, just for Wittgenstein to begin by saying in the Tractatus, the world is all that is the case. Another way this is commonly defined in, in contemporary philosophy is to say the world is states of affairs. States of affairs, it's, it's, not, just, it's not things, it's uh, situations. It's, or you could even say events, some people say events now. Well, the problem with that is, if everything were just states of affairs, that means everything is already completely deployed in what it, every, everything is simply, if I am simply my st set of states of affairs at the moment, then I already am all that I am right now, here. Why would I ever change? Why would anything new happen if I already am all that I am? There has to be something. Okay. But what, I don't get that example. Which am I? Oh, I'm not sure if we have to get into that, but... I'm not hiding them. The real, uh, I believe in objects. I believe that the world is not a set of, state of states of affairs. What do you believe in? This is what I was talking about on Friday. One thing we have to, there's, there's, there's an idea that uh, realism is, is for the old fogies and that all the action is on the other side of the fence. I would disagree. Uh, you still haven't answered my, my point about how if a thing is just a state of affairs, nothing would ever change. And I think that's, a, that's the crux of the issue. Anyone who tries to build a metaphysics around state of affairs, states of affairs cannot explain how anything would ever change because it, the world is already all that it is. And you said something about a, the world is what a, some sort of change? Yes, but objects could also constantly change without being... The more they stay the same. Okay, I would also say that your, th your theory of states of affairs is no, by no means universally accepted anymore. We've got this debate even in analytic philosophy between Russell and Frege on the one side who think that a name is an abbreviation for a list of qualities. So that if I say Teo, it's a and it's an abbreviation for everything that I know about him, which actually isn't that much yet. It's only only a certain most superficial and. Besides the first thing I mentioned, it's it's even though an idol is Yes, but I'm only a third finished. You should let me finish all the way. The, the, the second version of the theory is what they call the cluster theory, which is Searle and Strawson, who say that, well, I should first say, the, prob the obvious problem with Frege and Russell's theory is, if I say, here's Teo, he comes from Russia, and it turns out to be false, I'm still speaking about Teo, right? I'm speaking about something that's deeper than the list of qualities that I thought. And so Searle and Strawson develop what they call the cluster theory to Im immunize themselves from this objection, which is that just most of the properties have to be right for me to still be referring about Teo. Now, what does most mean? Does it mean a democratic vote? Does it mean the most important ones and the most important ones according to whom? And so then you had finally Kripke's theory unveiled in 1970, which is that no, a name is simply pointing to something. It's stipulating this is Teo and he must have an essence, otherwise he would be the, different, uh, the same as all of us, it wouldn't be different. But unless I'm pointing at something, then I'm not immunized from this possibility that every time the qualities of Teo change, I'm not referring to the same person anymore, which is clearly counterintuitive. Why should the immediate state of affairs count for more than my stipulation that this is Teo. Why should the uh, list of qualities that we know about him weigh more heavily than this? Yeah, but you, you, you're the one who's going to be wrong. I'm the one who is immunized by pointing and saying this is Teo. It's possible I'm hallucinating him and there's no such person, but I'm at least then referring to the same person across all of these discussions we're having. Whereas for you, every time we learn an inequality about him, he's a different person. I'm losing sight of the, we have to change his name. Okay. Is 
Is that is that true? Yeah. I don't see. What what I'm losing you here? Categorical imperative. I've not said the least thing about ethics tonight. I don't know where the categorical imperative is getting into this. Okay. No, that's not categorical imperative. I don't know what the term would be. Rigid designator is the term when you're pointing at something directly. That's Kripke's term. Categorical imperative is an ethical term. Someone else want to get involved? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. The second is the subject. The other two is the power of action. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay, subject I'm deliberately kicking out. Um, and even when you see it in someone like Badiou, who's a, who has a very sophisticated model of the subject, the subject is what uh, experiences truth events. Uh, that break through the current st state of things. Uh, but it only seems to be humans to do it for Badiou. And I think any time you have a, sub a philosophy of the subject, this is going to be the problem, that people are not going to have anything to say about inanimate causal relations, which philosophers are supposed to be universal. So philosophers are supposed to talk about everything, which means I can't just be talking about human experience. I have to be talking about things that happen, be uh, events that happen between two other objects. So it's yeah, a subject I'm simply not interested in. And I would, s except in the sense that all objects would be subjects, all objects would do things and experience things. Um, language, I would consider myself largely a Heideggerian on the question of language, and, and people, he's misunderstood. Uh, for most philosophers of language, language is the human access to the world, and that's all that we can know. We have to talk about the conditions of how humans access the world rather than talking about the world itself. The way Heidegger puts it is that language is the interplay of world and thing. And when you break this down, what he really means is it's the interplay between the hidden thing and the way it appears to us. There's a kind of hinge that holds those two sides of the world together. And language, for Heidegger, it's similar to Kripke. It's pointing. It's, he calls it summoning or calling or naming. You're pointing at something without making it completely present. Presence is always bad for Heidegger because then you're reducing it to its qualities. You're missing what's, what's deeper there. And so um, um, that, I would say that is the status of language. I would not say language is an object. I would say words are objects, right, because uh, you can... What's the what are the criteria for an object for me? The thing has to be unified. It has to be more real than any perceptions of it. It's more real than any use that can be made of it. And words are like this. You can reflect on the exact connotations of a word endlessly, and it still el eludes your grasp. Even if humans created it, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, the, the, you're Like, but, but you were you were distracting me too, so it would be helpful. That's no problem. Excuse me. Give other people a hard time and you can't take it yourself. That's remarkable.
w where in Badiou do two things interact with no human on the, on the scene? I never see that. I can't get that answer from any Badiouian I know, and there are many in this city. Um, none of them have never been able to explain that issue to me. Where is the theory of causation? Badiou doesn't even seem to think the philosophy of nature is relevant to philosophy. Right? You can't really have a theory of causation. He doesn't have much to say about physics, biology, these sorts of sciences. I think you see it in Whitehead, but I think the problem with Whitehead is that, uh, again, the thing is reduced to its relations, reduced to its qualities, and the thing doesn't really endure across time. Yes. We need to bring things together mm -hmm. so that something that we haven't seen before, it could be from the bias and therefore could, like this Pasteur, for example, which is kind of killed by the function. Uh -huh. You can say, of course, the things can be such, uh, as we have heard before, uh, only uh, in modal abbreviation, all of them, they change their kind of extra networks and therefore they become something like a human. Uh -huh. So how exactly is it something like direct causality, direct translation, uh, cause? It's hard for me because I have a, a problem there to solve that Tor doesn't have to, have to solve, which is that you have the things absent from each other yet somehow inter interacting in a medium. He simply gets around it by saying things have to negotiate from the start. They're never separated. I'm saying that he runs into philosophical problems when he does that. And so he, ha he needs to have this new theory of how causation occurs. And he doesn't. Uh, and it's a big task ahead. So I, I can't begin to say tonight how I'm going to go about making that possible. But it, it does have something to do with converting the real things into perceptual things on the inside of a third entity, and they can interact on that surface level without involving the whole depth. Mm. All right. Thanks to everybody. I enjoyed the projects today. Nice meeting you all.